So can everyone hear me all right? Yes. So I'm unfortunately, someone absconded with all of the little clip-on microphones, so I get to pretend to be a stand-up comedian as I give this talk there today. Um, so yeah, so I've spent most of this quarter trying to kind of give you guys a flavor of the, the work in uh, modern condensed matter theory that I do my research in. And the whole point of telling you that whole story, uh, besides the fact that I think it's very, a very interesting and beautiful uh, story of physics, is that it lets me now finally tell you guys about the work that I actually do. Uh, uh, so that, that's what we're going to do. I mean, cutting edge is in, you know, hopefully, if I have time to get through the end of it, I'll be telling you about results we came up with la uh, earlier this year. Before I begin in earnest, someone finally pointed out to me that on, I think, every single handout I've given out, there has been a very embarrassing typo. Uh, no one called me out on it until this morning. That there, of course, should be a tilde in front of my name in the URL. So if you tried to go to this website and you put a space in there and it didn't work, that is the reason. I apologize. Uh, I never bothered to check my own webpage, so I never noticed it. Wait, is that a space thing? Like really it's, it's just a tilde. I made it red so that you can figure out where the mistake is. So this is a space on the on the handout. It should, of course, be a tilde. And if you go to this website, well, after this afternoon when I upload it, every set of slides and handouts will be uh, given on this page. Um, though I'm not sure if those are as useful as, as Roy's very helpful uh, screen recordings. Um, but all right. So as I said, I'm going to be spending today talking about uh, my actual active piece of research in uh, fractional quantum Hall states, which I've talked about. And uh, time permitting, I'm hoping to make some impressive comparisons to active experiments that are being done. So, so previously, I talked about a whole bunch of these uh, quantum Hall plateaus. So let's remind ourselves, what is this a plot of? This kind of mostly diagonal with some plateaus curve is experimental measurement of the Hall resistance. The Hall resistance is you apply a current in the x direction, and you measure the voltage differential in the y direction. Ohm's law tells you their ratio is a resistance, and that's this. So you find that this number takes universal values. H and E, H is just Planck's constant. E is uh, the electric charge. And the resistance is H divided by E squared divided by some number nu. And for each of these little plateaus, there is, we write down what that number is. So here is the integer state 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. cetera. Uh, you'll notice that the, you know, some of these are very wide, some of these are not so wide. Uh, every time there's one of these plateaus, you also find that this other curve down below that you can think of as basically being the normal conductance. So that's a measure of if I try to apply a voltage differential in the x direction, how much current flows in that x direction. So when it dips to zero, we think of that system as being a, an insulator, right? It does not conduct electricity in the normal way, the way a metal does. So you see here, one, there's this nice deep well. We find that it's an insulator. One third is the famous Laughlin state. It's very nice. But you notice that there are a whole bunch of other states in here. And what we're going to focus on today is a bunch of states that were studied originally by, among other people, Genera Jane. So they're often referred to as the Jane states. So let's make this picture nice and big. So we start with the one-third state, and we're going to follow a sequence. And those of you who uh, play around with numerology might notice something interesting. So there's one-third, and then two-fifths, three-sevenths, four-ninths. There's clearly a pattern there. This is older data, so it's not as sharp, but newer experiments have confirmed that these really, the normal conductance really dips down to zero. Right, and there, there really are good, robust plateaus there. And similarly, we can start on the other side. We can start with two fifths, three, uh, sorry, two thirds, three fifths, four sevenths, five ninths. And again, there's a clear pattern, right? And so let's just point out what that pattern is. On this side, we have a nice pattern where this number nu, this nice rational number, takes on the pattern of n divided by two n plus one. Right? That gives you this series. And on the other side, we have n plus 1 over 2n plus 1. Right? Now, this formula doesn't make it immediately obvious, but it's clear that if I sum up this guy and this guy, I get 1 half. If I sum up this guy and this guy, I get 1 half, so on and so forth. So I can think of these states as being related to these states by a reflection about 1 half. So, so I mean, 
first of all, clear as n goes to infinity, this is going to march its way to 1 half. And similarly, as this guy goes to infinity, it's going to march its way to 1 half. And I just want to point out for now that there's, a, there's an interesting reflection symmetry that looks apparent here, where these guys are related to these guys just by reflection about 1 half. So these are the Jane states. Usually these, these original one, 1 third, 2 fifth, et cetera, are called the, the Jane se sequence or Jane series. And the reflected guys are called the conjugate sequence or series. Uh, so 1 third, 2 fifth. Uh, so one third, two fifths, etc., or two thirds, three fifths, and so on and so forth. These have been experimentally observed on both sides up to n equals ten as good insulating plateaus. And based on the fact that they're all approaching one half, and uh, they they're reflected around each other, they reflect around one half instead of zero. There's a sense in which all of these states come from a a parent state, which is this different state. At, at one half instead of zero. And I want to emphasize that unlike all of these other states, this is not an artifact of this being an early experiment. The one half state is not an insulator, right? This uh, conductance is finite. So unlike all of these other funny states, something special happens here. The system is allowed to conduct. It's not an incompressible fluid. It's a, it's a, it's a very non-trivial, more metallic-like state. Are there any questions so far? Yeah? yeah one third and two thirds equals one. Sorry, yes, of course, yes. They sum to one, they're reflecting I don't about know one half. Anything else about this, but I do know. Good, I'm well, glad someone pointed that out. Yeah, yeah. That tells you how, how tired I am. Um, <laughs> yes? When you pointed out about that one half, is that why the line is like, uh, that resistance line is going like in a. This, 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 oh, no, no, oh, up here? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the actual statement is that, so there's this broad window here, and it's only at a very finely tuned have. value. That's what no, 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 the, 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 slope, the slope is given by the classical Hall relationship. The, the, the point is that for all of these other states, there's this wide plateau where the value is one third, or two fifths, or, or, or so forth. Whereas for one half, there's no wide plateau. It's clear that there's only exactly one value of the magnetic field where the Hall conductance is really one half oh, okay. instead, of, instead of some wide range. And that's related to the fact that it is not this nice big insulating window. Okay, so, so we want to, since, since I've at least tried to motivate, and we'll do it uh, in, in more detail later, we tried to motivate that at uh, filling fraction one half, if we understand that state, we should be able to understand at least some of the nearby states. What does it look like, right? Uh, it conducts, and so since it conducts, we can ask the same basic question we asked about metals. What are the light degrees of freedom in that state that allow the system to conduct? All right. And, and we know, or we might assume that, well, the light degrees of freedom shouldn't be charged particles sitting in a magnetic field. Because as I've said previously, charged particles in a magnetic field get trapped in cyclotron orbits, and they can't conduct normally. Now this is, this is a bit of a cheat, but I, I, it's, it, it, it's useful to think that if the light degrees of freedom that were giving us a finite conductance were really particles that were charged in the sense that they felt a magnetic field, we would not expect it to be a nice, normal conducting state. We would expect it to be insulated because of this previous slide that I've shown you before, the charged particles usually get trapped in orbits. So if the one half state can conduct, something that we might expect, I, I, I'm not giving you the most robust motivation, but we'll see that it works. What you might expect is that they are effectively neutral. And what do I mean by that being effectively neutral? I mean that whatever the light <coughs> degrees of freedom in this state are, they don't feel a magnetic field at filling fraction one half. Okay? And this is going to prove consistent with many experiments. And so this, this statement that at one half, the charged particles do not feel a magnetic field, we're just going to see where that takes us, see if we can get any mileage out of that idea. So remember that the definition of the filling fraction, this number we label by Greek letter nu, that's related to the Hall resistance, 
is simply defined as following. Okay, we have a material, and imagine considering a, a piece of you know, some small uh, volume of that material. You ask how many electrons are in that sample, and how many magnetic flux lines or magnetic field lines are going through that piece of sample. Because remember, magnetic fields are, are basically kind of vectors in space, and so we can count how many magnetic field lines are going through that uh, sample. I'll have some pictures shortly. So remembering that this is the, the definition, I'm going to tell you a story that's uh, a story called flux attachment that will lead us to the right idea. And the idea is just going to be, what if the electron can absorb some of the magnetic field lines? Which sounds crazy, and it kind of is crazy, but it'll work, as, as we'll see. So here's my picture, okay? So this is exactly at half filling. I have half as many electrons as I have magnetic field lines. That's, by definition, what it means to be at half filling. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I'm going to invent a new type of particle that lives in this system. And it's a particle that has two field lines bound to an electron. That's going to be something I'm going to call the composite fermion. So what does that look like? OK, so again, if I have did my uh, arithmetic right, if I have four electrons, I have to have eight field lines. So what if we imagine each electron absorbs two field lines? Okay, and then we call this non-trivial composite object that was an electron that absorbed two lines of the magnetic field. I'm going to call that the composite. It's a composite fermion. I say composite fermion because it still has fermionic statistics the same way that an electron has fermionic statistics. So it still uh, has to satisfy Pauli exclusion and all of that good stuff. So then I have this new object. It's eaten all of the magnetic field lines. That means that there's no magnetic flux left. So even though these particles are charged, because they're built out of an electric field, they don't feel any magnetic field lines anymore. They've kind of swallowed them all up. So th this, this, is my, this is my picture of how I can have charged particles that don't feel a magnetic field, and so in a sense are effectively neutral. They've kind of swallowed up all of the magnetic field lines. Do have any questions about this picture? Wait, what is it? CS stands for composite fermion, because I started with the electron, and the electron is a fermion, okay. and it kind of soaked up two magnetic field lines through the sample to make a new object that's a composite fermion, and I kind of dashed the remnants of the magnetic field line so that we could keep track of them if we wanted to count the filling fraction, but they're not left in the sense that there are no remaining field lines for the composite fermions to feel. Okay, so it's not really good. It's, it's not an electron. It's clearly not an electron because since there's no magnetic field lines left for it to feel, if I push it, it won't get trapped in cyclotron orbits. Okay. So it's clearly something different than an electron. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? So this idea of a uh, magnetic field line, um, I'm imagining a picture like uh, iron filings around a magnet. And I've always imagined that to be somewhat oversimplified of what we would think classically of the real physics is that something makes, uh, makes uh, lines and spaces in between lines in so, the picture, but in reality, what is between the lines? Is so, OK, so, so this, this is a very good question. So when I talk about magnetic field lines, I, I've said previously there is this, you know, because magnetic fields are kind of vectors in space, they're arrows pointing in a position, that's a classical point of view. And if you really try to think about magnetic field in a quantum mechanical sense, you find that they, they're discretized in the same way that charge is discretized into being built out of, say, electrons or protons. Um, a, a, a subtlety that I've not, I, I don't want to get into in too much detail, though it's a very interesting story, is that you remember how previously I told you guys that uh, an electron secretly is a tiny magnet. And so if it's a tiny magnet, it should have a magnetic field around it, right? So something that's not at all obvious from this is the fact that if I ask each one of these electrons how many ma intrinsic magnetic fields does it have, the answer is two of the fundamental units of magnetic field lines. And you might ask, is that somehow related to the fact that this composite fermion is absorbing two more magnetic field lines? And the answer is actually not really. It's, it's, it's a cute symmetry. That it's because we're studying these states around 
uh, one half. If I had instead, if you squint and look at this data and notice that, oh, there's another sequence around here that's, uh, oh, sorry, there's another sequence out here that you can't see that is basically a mirror, mirror copy of these states, except they're approaching one quarter instead of one half. And this one half is related to eating two lines of magnetic flux. If I had looked at the states around one quarter, I would be eating four lines of magnetic flux. Is there some name for this fundamental unit of magnetic flux? It's the fundamental unit of magnetic flux. Isn't it? You hit it right on the head. You can you can write it down in terms of natural in terms of natural units. I, I'm sure I did in a previous lecture. Because I, if I wrote down what the fundamental uh, magnetic field strength for a single electron is, divide that by two, that's the true answer. And for uh, to experts in the audience, it's of course not exactly two, two. It's two if you just look at regular Q, if you look at kind of, if, if you don't think about non-trivial quantum effects. Non-trivial quantum effects, as, as Feynman calculated, tells you that the number isn't quite two, it's actually a number very slightly less than two. And that's something that's been kind of experimentally very well verified. What happens to the vector unit? So what do you mean? The vector unit is irrelevant to this point? Well, so, so all of the magnetic fields are, are pointing exactly perpendicular to the plane. And so I'm always assuming that the field lines are directly perpendicular. So all I have to keep track of is their magnitude. OK. Right. So, so as we said, at half filling, we can sheet and absorb all of the magnetic field lines. Uh, and we now have new charged objects that feel no magnetic field. Now this is a pictorial story, um, but you could you could work out an explicit uh, physical model that lets you calculate things, and in that system you can directly calculate, and you find that at one half it's a normal conductor, and at, you know if, if I have my magnetic field sitting right here, I get some number here, and I get exactly one half the Hall conductance there. Um, but again, I don't want to get into the details of how you really do these microscopic calculations. I want to try to make it a little more pictorial. Okay. But so, so all I've done is I've told you that there's this nice state at one half. But I, I, I was telling you earlier that this should describe all of these states surrounding it. So let's try another one, right? Let's try Laughlin state. So what is Laughlin state? The filling factor is one third. So in my picture I've drawn here, I have three electrons and nine flux lines, right? So let's eat up six of those flux lines and attach them and turn those into composite fermions. Ah, but we haven't used up all the field lines yet, right? So now, remember that these guys have the charge. We're, we're assuming these guys basically have the charge of one electron. So now, these composite fermions are sitting in a magnetic field. And in particular, let's calculate the effective filling fraction the effective filling fraction is 1, right? Because the number of remaining field lines is 3, and the number of composite fermions is 3. So the filling fraction is 1. And as I argued a few weeks ago, if I have integer filling fractions, I know I'm going to have a nice plateau. I'm going to have an insulating state, because I filled up exactly one Landau level. So this is a picture that people hopefully remember from a few weeks ago. Uh, so, but now, you, you might worry, oh, this is an integer state, so shouldn't the whole resistance be one instead of one third? And the answer is actually no, uh, because the actual electron charges to total field lines is one third, you still find that the Hall resistance is the one third Hall resistance, not a one Hall resistance. This is a subtle calculation to see that this is the case, but the answer, the, the punchline is going to be the following. Any time I can argue that I'm in an insulating state, I can calculate total number of electron charges to total field lines, not total remaining field lines. And that gives me a ratio. And that will be exactly what the Hall conductance is. All right. So that's nice. I explained to you the one third state. And this is a, a very different looking explanation for why there is a insulating quantum Hall state at one third. It's a very different story than the original Laughlin story. Bob Laughlin just wrote down a wave function and everything magically worked. Here I'm trying to give you a picture of what exactly is happening. Now you may recall previously 
I had this I, I had this story where these guys were kind of spread out. Since they feel a weaker uh, magnetic field, their cyclotron orbits are going to be bigger. And so, in this picture, it's those lar larger cyclotron orbits is the reason that the electrons are less densely packed. Whereas in Laughlin's argument, it was explicitly the repulsive interactions that pushed the electrons far apart from each other and gave us a, a less charge-dense state. Uh, again, those sound like very different explanations, but they're actually kind of subtly related. Um, but again, that, that's just the one-third state. But since we already had an explanation for the one-third state, that's not terribly exciting. Let's try another state. So let's try two-fifths, right? That was the next one in the sequence. So if I have four electrons and 10 magnetic field lines, that's two-fifths. But, of course, I see that if I gobble up as many field lines as I need to, what do I find? I find that now I have four electrons and two field lines. So the effective filling fraction is two, right? So again, using this pictorial story of electrons gobbling up field lines, I again have found that my new light degrees of freedom, this composite fermion, find themselves in an integer state. And this being in an integer state is enough to guarantee that the system will be insulating and that the normal conductance goes to zero, and I should get a robust plateau. Because once you get a picture that looks like this, you can kind of use a lot of the words that I said for the integer state previously. Okay. And it turns out that, again, with this basic arithmetic, if I can do it correctly, <laughs> always tells us the following. Okay, imagine a state with filling factor n divided by 2n plus 1. What does that mean? That means we have 2n plus 1 field lines for n electrons, right? So everything works out perfectly. If each electron eats two field lines, there's one remaining field line for n electrons. So the effective filling fraction is going to be n. So this story exactly explains well, this pictorial explains to us why I get these nice, robust, insulating plateaus for one-third, two-fifths, three-sevenths, four-ninths, so on and so forth. This argument makes it sound like n can go all the way to infinity, but of course, you know, there's only a finite amount of magnetic field that I can tune through to see that. So people have seen this up to n equals 10. Are there any questions? Great. So that's nice. That tells us about these states. But what about the other states, right? I told you that it was very important to be able to describe these other states as well. So let's just try following through with this story again. So the two-thirds state, again, in, in one kind of small region, I have two electrons and three, three magnetic field lines, two-thirds. OK, so what happens if I try to gobble up all the field lines? Well, it's obvious what's going to happen, right? I don't have enough. I'm in trouble, right? I ran out. So what, so what, so what, what do we do now? And, and the answer is, again, we're going to kind of pictorially cheat. If I have a region where there are no field lines, I can think of a region with no field lines as the same as a region with a up field line and a down field line right next to each other, right? This is, this is really kind of like pair creating a plus and minus pair of magnetic field lines. And, and again, you're starting to see why this is really a pictorial story and not a detailed physical story, because this seems a little hokey. But let's go with it for now and see what happens. If we go with it, well, then there's another field line that this kind of guy can absorb. And what am I left with? I'm left with two charged particles and one field line. The field line is just pointing in the other direction. But that's not really a problem, because when we talk about the integer quantum Hall state, we don't really care whether I have the sample and the magnetic field is pointing up, or you have the sample and the magnetic field is pointing down. That's, that's just a simple reflection. Yes? So, like, where, the, where you found that magnetic field line, like, you sort of just took away that one that's holding up so that you can merge it to create that uh, quantum yeah, so, 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 so here I see that if I just look at the field lines I started with, I don't have en enough. So I imagine saying, well, no field line is equal to an up field line plus a down field line. So let's take an up field line plus a down field line, and then pull this up field line, pair it to my remaining electron, call both of those things composite fermions, and then indeed I see that I have a nice effective filling fraction. It's minus two, 
but that's 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 fine. Yeah. I was gonna ask, where did you find like how did the uh, up field line and down field line really come about? Like, how, did they, you know, how did I make them out of nothing? Yeah. I I, I said one plus minus one is zero. Okay. I mean, on it, like, what I did here was literally that. I said one plus minus one is zero, so I could take plus one, put it over here. I'm left with minus one. Oh, now okay. that's that's because this is a pictorial story, okay. and as as we'll see, there are going to be problems with this story. Oh, okay. yeah. Well, is that um, analogous to the concept of random quantum field fluctuations? No. This, this, this is this is analogous to one plus minus one being zero. Yes. So one plus minus one. Minus one is minus one. I mean, that, okay, it's, it's pictures. This is, I, I'm, go, I'm going to try to give you a better explanation for what's happening here later. So in other words, you're manipulating like a formula by using like zero in an equation. With yeah, yeah I, I, I'm just saying that if I had to have one more, I have to be left with minus one. That's all. Okay, yeah. But, but it, it, the punchline is here, for the two-thirds state, I'm still left with an effective integer filling fraction. Let's try another one. Three electrons, five magnetic flux. You can guess what's going to happen, right? I'm just one short. So again, I pair P8, and again, I absorb it, and I call everything a composite fermion, and now I have three composite fermions for one down flux, so the effective filling fraction is still an integer. And again, this number is always going to be the measured Hall resistance. This effective filling fraction being an integer is only required to make sure that we have a we have a vanishing normal conductance and we have a wide plateau. So again, you can go through that same arithmetic for the filling fraction n plus one over two n plus one. I assume every electron absorbs two field lines, and again, I'm pretty sure I did this right. I'm left with minus one. So there's always one field line left for n plus one electrons. So the effective filling fraction is minus n plus 1, which is different, right? Because for these guys, I have plus n. And you're already starting to see a sign of the asymmetry, right? So, so, so clearly, I, I, I do not have a nice, uh, remember, I, I tried to motivate this by saying there's a reflection symmetry about nu equals a half. And I want my story to exhibit that reflection symmetry. And I've kind of lost it here, right? Because for one third, I have effective filling fraction one, but for two thirds, I have effective filling fraction minus two. And similarly, for two fifths, I have two. For three fifths, I have minus three. And this is kind of ugly, right? I'd be, I'd be much happier if, say, this was plus two and this was minus two, something like that. Right? Then it would look significantly more symmetric. Um, th this asymmetry is related to a, a serious problem called, we expect something called particle hole symmetry, which I will talk about shortly, um, uh, that, that's going to lead us to a, a better explanation. But before I get into that, I, I want to say a few words about how much of this is a picture and how much of this is actually <laughs> physically real in the, in, in the following sense. Right? I told you, I drew pictures where I said electrons absorb field lines, and then that meant I had charged particles that didn't feel a magnetic field at filling fraction one half. Now, is that a story, or is there an actual physical sense in which that is true? Right? And what do I mean by that? I, the question is, can you directly detect the existence of an object that I can call the composite fermion? Right? And now, imagine the following, okay? So, so, so here's my picture, right? I have composite fermions, and if I'm exactly at one half, there are no field lines left for them to feel. Now, what does that mean? That means that if I'm just barely away from one half, they're going to feel a very, very weak magnetic field. And I want to remind you guys, this is an old picture of what the quantum Hall system looks like. And it's clear that in very strong magnetic fields, I get these wide plateaus, but I want to point out that if the magnetic field is very weak, I have normal conductance. Remember, this green curve is the normal conductance. So here I see that in these wide plateaus, there's no normal conductance. But if the magnetic field isn't strong enough, it can conduct. It can behave kind of nicely. It can behave basically semi-classically. What's happening here is that the magnetic field isn't very strong, and so 
the electrons in this story can just move in very, very wide cyclotron orbits. And so the question is, can we do that with the composite fermion? Okay. So imagine I tune my system to be at precisely the right magnetic field so that the Hall conductance is exactly one half. And then I tune my magnetic field just a little bit away from that. What do I expect to happen? Well, if it's exactly one half, these charged particles felt no magnetic field. If I move a little bit away from one half, they will feel a magnetic field that's proportional to my distance from whatever the magnetic field had to be to give me exactly one half. Okay. Now, that, that's a nice story, but can you measure this? And the answer is actually amazingly yes. Uh, Wu Wan Kang of the University of Chicago back in 1993, but I don't think he was here back then, did an experiment in which he did the following, okay? He took his quantum Hall sample, and he put a bunch of little defects in the sample, but not randomly. He arranged them in a sharp grid pattern. And the idea is the following. As I tune away from exactly being at the magnetic field to have half filling, I expect if composite fermions exist, in, in a physical sense, that as I tune away from it a little bit, I might get resonances, right? Because depend, as I change the magnetic field, the size of the orbit will change. And if I change the diameter of the orbit to be commensurate with lattice spacing, then I might get some resonances, right? It might bounce off of these defects and make something noticeable. Whereas if the diameter of these cyclotron orbits is not commensurate, I don't expect to see any effects. And he did, in fact, see that. So this is, this is the original data, and it's not terribly enlightening. Uh, this is a more recent work. This should not be 1993. This should be 2005, I think. Uh, and, and the important thing to take away from this picture is that here he is tuning the magnetic field, and there is a dip here, and a smaller dip here, and so forth. And these, these dips here and here correspond precisely to his composite fermions orbits being at a diameter precisely commensurate with the lattice defect he put the system in to get these resonances. And it's actually kind of an anti-resonance because the problem is that if it's hitting just these orbits, it can't conduct nicely because it keeps bouncing into the defects. But the punchline here is that since there is an actual dip here and an actual dip here and an actual dip here and here, there is a real physical sense in which in this system, at least near the magnetic field strength where I get Hall conductance one half, the light degrees of freedom are not just normal charged electrons. What they are is that they are an object that basically feels an effective magnetic field strength proportional to the distance of your magnetic field from this finely tuned value. And moreover, I just want to point out here that this picture of seeing these resonances looks pretty nicely reflection symmetric, about one half, as do all of these other sequences. So the, 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 the punchline I want to, again, I want you guys to take away from this is that while I started this story with some ludicrous picture of electrons gobbling up magnetic field lines, it's a useful intuitive guide because we find experimentally that, in fact, when we look at states in this region, the light degrees of freedom are charged particles that feel a magnetic, an effective magnetic field strength proportional to not the actual magnetic field strength, but a magnetic field strength measured by the distance from this magnetic field strength. Are there any questions? Question. Yeah. Um, maybe I missed it from earlier, but what am I supposed to think of when I light degrees of freedom? Oh, good. So, so I, I, I discussed this previously when I talked about kind of metals versus insulators. So when I say a light degree of freedom, I'm always talking about kind of the electronic structure of a system, how well it can, it can how well stuff can move through it, okay? And, and so what they, light or heavy is, an, an, well, it's, it's really high energy terminology. It's a question of how much energy does it take to go from the state I'm starting with to a state where particles are moving. So if I just have Let's say I can think of a metal as just a gas of electrons. That's like a fluid. And so it does not, it takes, you know, I can push the charges 
by adding as small amount of energy as I want to. And that means the system is conducting if there are light or really gapless degrees of freedom. There's no minimum energy. However, weakly I push the system, particles will move. And that's what a metal looks like, right? I can draw, I can put as weak a voltage differential across a metal as I want, and there will always be some uh, current flowing through it. On the other hand, if I have an insulator, what you find is that if you apply a very weak voltage differential, because voltage differentials are just measures of energy, if I apply too weak a voltage differential, no particles will flow, which means that the system doesn't really like to conduct. I have to kick this system with some finite amount of energy to get particles to start flowing through. So yeah, that, that, that's the terminology. So when I say light degrees of freedom, I mean, you know, it's easy to move these particles around. Heavy degrees of freedom, you have to kick them really hard. So if you want a particle physics example, uh, a photon is light, because you can kind of make a photon with as long a wavelength as you want, but to create you know, a proton, I have to pay, at the very least, the cost of the mass of the proton. Now, once I have a proton sitting in space, it doesn't cost me any additional energy to move. Similarly with an electron, that's why once you already have an electron gas, it's a conductor. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay, good. All right, any other questions? All right. So again, as I said previously, our naive flux attachment story uh, has an asymmetry with the reflection around uh, half the nu equals one half state. Why do we care about that, right? Well, it's a nice symmetry, but that's not enough. I mean, it's a nice picture of reflection in my plot, but that's not enough to actually make me really care about it physically. The real reason is that there's an actual physical symmetry called particle hole symmetry. So what do I mean by particle hole symmetry? So let's, for the moment, turn off the subtleties of interactions and just imagine I have Landau levels, I have electrons, and I get to decide where I'm going to put those electrons, okay? So here I have some assignment, I put some electrons in the lowest and some of the lowest level states, I put some electrons in some of the highest level states, and I can imagine a very simple symmetry, a symmetry that says every state that's unoccupied is now occupied, and every state that was occupied is now unoccupied, all right? And it's obvious that if I do this twice, I always come back to itself. So it's an interesting symmetry. Um, now, I don't want to do this everywhere, because it's clear in this picture, if I do this in every possible band, remember that this n equals 0, 1, and 2 is, is labeling the energy cost of putting an electron in one of those states. So if I do this symmetry on every band, I'm changing the energy of the system of doing something very drastic. So I don't want to do that. Right. That, that if I if I do that, I go from a state that has energy one to a state that has a much larger energy, and so I don't really intuitively have any reason to expect that those things should be related at all. What if we just do this exchange in one band? Okay. So here again, I'm assuming that well, I have some electrons in the lowest level, some electrons in the first level, so on and so forth. And you say, well, what if I just do this reflection in one band? Does that look nice? And the answer is, in the free case, yes, but once I turn on interactions, no. Because the way these electrons interact with these guys is going to look very different than the way these electrons are going to interact with these guys. And so what we're going to use is we're going to use a trick that I discussed a few weeks ago, where I kind of try to decouple the bands. So imagine you have a, and no interactions, I have a partially filled lowest level. Right? So the energy spacing is just proportional magnetic field and is inversely proportional to the electron mass. If I turn on interactions, I know that as long as this energy cost is finite, the new quantum state isn't just going to be a linear superposition of electrons being in this lowest band, it'll also be superimposed with electrons being in the higher band, right? There's some energy splitting here, and these guys get with the love too. But if I, if as, as long as interactions tell me that I'm going to have some electrons in higher bands, then this part of the whole symmetry is really not useful at all for me. But I can try to separate the scales, right? So imagine I send this energy spacing to infinity, holding the other energy spacing fixed. In that nominal limit, I find that 
There's, I don't have to worry about the electrons being in this higher state. They're really just living in this lower state. Now you might ask, this is some scaling symmetry. Is this really acceptable? It turns out, actually, experimentally, for the states that we're looking in, the actual energy spacing measured here is much, much smaller than the energy spacing here. So this decoupling is a, is a reasonable approximation for the actual physical system we're looking at. So in this limit, and this is not at all obvious, and I've not shown you the details to convince you that it's true. In this limit, where I completely decouple these guys, this particle hole symmetry is an exact symmetry of the interacting electron problem. What does that mean? That means if I put in some fractional filling of this state, and I turn on interactions, and I find myself an interacting, insulating, fractional quantum Hall plateau, then I must, if I do the particle hole conjugate, so I say, instead of having a filling fraction you know, nu, I have a filling fraction 1 minus nu, I have to also get an insulating fractional quantum Hall plateaus. And they have to be related to each other in a, in, a, in a very nice, simple way. That's going to be related to the fact that if I didn't have interactions, it was just particles go to no particles, and no particles go to particles. And as I said previously, our, our picture of you know, flux attachment or magnetic field line absorption just didn't demonstrate this particle hole symmetry in a nice way. Um, there are kind of subtle mathematical reasons uh, why that I'll, I'll say a few words about. A, a slightly more subtle model that I'm going to show you a picture of will, and that's something called the composite Dirac fermion. Um, I would prefer to maybe call this something else like the composite graphene model, but this, this is the name. So this, this was something invented by um, my boss, Dam Sun, maybe two years ago as a solution to this issue of this symmetry. Um, in this story, there's no longer a nice, simple picture of electrons absorbing field lines. What there will be is a picture where we map a partially filled uh, level to a new integer state. In the same way that we said, well, as soon as the effective filling fraction is an integer, this looks like an integer state, so everything behaves nicely. This is, but since there's no exact picture of absorbing field lines, this is really a emergent low energy behavior. So the composite fermions, which are real physical objects, are not simply just electrons with stuff glued to them. It's a new emergent degree of freedom, which you can think of as saying, well, if I have a whole bunch of water molecules packed together, then there is new emergent behavior, which is just fluid dynamics. Or you can think of it as you start with a bunch of quarks, and then at low energy is like at baryons and, and mesons and so forth. So how is this true composite fermion? And I should be careful saying true because not everyone buys this story just yet. We're working hard to convince them. How does this true composite fermion differ? So remember, in my flux attachment story, I had this funny mapping where n over 2n plus 1 went to plus n. And n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 went to minus n minus 1. And this is just kind of ugly and asymmetric. So what, what if we just squint and say, well, why don't I take the average? Why don't I say n over 2n plus 1 goes to plus n plus a half, and n plus 1 over 2n plus 1 goes to minus n minus a half, right? That, this looks much more symmetric than this, right, I hope. All right? But this seems crazy, because this isn't a nice integer value. So why would you expect things to be behaving nicely? And the motivation for this actually comes uh, from graphene. I think the idea basically originally came out of some previous work we had done trying to study quantum Hall systems, not in simple gallium arsenide, but in graphene. So to remind what people what graphene is, you take a chunk of graphite, you take some scotch tape, you put it on the graphene, you lift it up, and you put it on some substrate, and you get a two-dimensional sheet of carbon atoms. Um, this is the band structure of graphene. This is the picture. It's ignoring kind of defects in disorder because you made this with scotch tape. It's a very beautiful, perfect, two-dimensional hexagonal lattice. But you, and then you can say, well, this is a two-dimensional system that has charge. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to ask someone else to do it. I'm going to ask someone else to take that system and put it in a magnetic field and measure the Hall resistance. Because that's what I always do. And this is what you get. 
And it's different, right? This is a simple picture of gallium arsenide, where you see these plateaus, and they're always at positive integers. And graphene is really different. Graphene, you see there are positive plateaus, but there are also negative plateaus. All right, so something very different is happening here. So let's, let's look at this with a little more detail. So again, what is this a actual plot of? So this is the quantum Hall effect for a piece of graphene. The red curve is the Hall conductance, and the green curve is the, is the normal conductance. And so what do we find? We find something very puzzling. Right? We find that there are plateaus, but they're not at nice integer values. They're half integer values, one half, three halves, five halves, seven halves, and so forth. And similarly, it can go negative, right? There is minus a half, minus three halves, minus five halves, etc. And so here you're starting to see precisely the pattern that I wanted, right? Because I wanted to talk about some sort of system where I had nice integer states whose Hall conductance was half integer and it could be positive or negative. And this is the real hint. So, I mean, this is, yeah, so this is uh, from, a, from, I think, a Nature article from 2005. So, I mean, this, this, this is a real experimental picture. And you do, in fact, experimentally find one halves, three halves, and negative numbers as well. So, it's clear that graphene is something very different from the normal stories of metals we talked about. And why is that? And this is related to uh, this being called the Dirac uh, the Dirac composite fermion. So remember that uh, for when we actually think about quantum electrodynamics, when we think about actual electrons as Dirac particles, there are electrons and there are positrons, right? And an electron is a positive energy state that you occupy, but a, posi but a positron is a negative energy state that was occupied and then you unoccupy. So when I think about Dirac-like structures, I find that this is now again a picture of kind of available states. So for Dirac, there are a bunch of negative energy states, and naively I want them all to be filled, right? And there are a bunch of positive energy states, and I want them all to be empty, and then maybe there's some zero band. So how do I create an electron? I occupy one of these states. And that's a positively charged particle. Now these are all positively charged filled states. So if I remove one, that's a positron, right? I removed a negative energy state, so I added energy to the system, but I removed charge, so it's a positive particle. Okay? So it, it turns out that because of this Dirac-like structure of graphene, since I can both fill up positive bands and empty negative bands, Graphene has both positive and negative lambda levels in direct analogy to a Dirac-like particle both having pro positrons and electrons. And what we claim is that a true composite fermion story looks like a graphene state, not a regular integer state. And it's clear here that this story has a very nice reflection symmetry where I reflect between the positive and negative states. Question. Yes. What is that curve? What are those curves a function of? Here? Yeah, it says it's a function of concentration, but what does that mean? Uh, yes. So, so remember that there there are two ways to tune which uh, integer, which quantum Hall state you're in. One is to change the magnetic field, and if you change the magnetic field, you change how much space each electron in a lambda level takes up. And so, making the magnetic field uh, making the magnetic field bigger makes electrons fill up less and less of a level. And so, with a fixed number of electrons, I fill up fewer and fewer lambda levels as I increase the magnetic field. That is the reason that let me go back to the picture. Uh, Sorry. Good here. So as you look at this picture, as I increase the magnetic field at fixed electron number, at this value of the magnetic field, I have enough electrons uh, to fill up three levels, and then I change it, and then I only have enough electrons to fill up two levels, and then I only have enough electrons to fill up one level, because I'm making there more and more spaces in each Landau level. But 
since I'm just talking about how many electrons I have versus how much room is in each Lando level, you could just as easily dope the system, which changes the number of electrons in the system. So here, they just in a more direct way say, well, here I only have enough electrons to fill up this level, and here I only have enough electrons to fill up, you know, to, to not even fill up this level, and here I have more electrons, and here I have less, less electrons. But it's th this plot, well, it's technically in terms of doping, is completely analogous, analogous to um, this axis could easily be magnetic field, and there are plots that do it in terms of magnetic field. I just think this is a cleaner plot, so I picked it. But you, you, well, technically, this is a, a doping factor. You can also just think of it as magnetic field strength. Thank you. So, all right. So I'm trying to convince you that this funny story where I have negative filled Landau levels and positive, possibly empty Landau levels, is supposed to look like a composite fermion. Well, let's, let's first just ask, what does this system look like? So here is a picture where, again, this is my graphene lambda level structure. And you'll notice that there's some funny asymmetry. If I completely fill up this zero level, right, because these are all, since they're positive and negative energy ones, I'm just going to label them, but there's a special zero one. So if I completely fill up this zero level, I get Hall conductance plus one half. If I completely deplete the zero level, I get Hall conductance minus a half. So the symmetric point, the symmetric point, which would be you know, zero, is when I only partially fill, I only fill up half of this zero level. You, know, you can look at other things, right? If I fill up an additional one, I get three halves. If I empty this minus one band, I get minus three halves, and so on and so forth. Now remember, what did we say we wanted our rule to be? We wanted our rule to be the following. We wanted a map that says the regular chain states go to plus some number, and the conjugate chain states go to minus some number. So I'm just going to tell you what that map should look like. So here is a picture of the actual physical states in the material, and here is a picture of what graphene-like state I want to map them to. In the same sense that when we did the flux attachment story, flux attachment took a partially filled level and turned it into an integer-like level. Right? And so the claim is going to be the following. One third should be three halves. Two fifths should be five halves. Uh, three sevenths is seven halves, so on and so forth. And you can see the pattern here, right? The denominator is the numerator here. And similarly, for these other guys, two-fifths, I want to be minus three-halves, three-fifths, and, and so on and so forth. So this is the mapping that we want to propose. Right? And there is, of course, a, a, a more precise mathematical version of it. But this is basically the mapping that you can think of in analogy to the flux attachment mapping. Um, but here, I'm just making symmetries more manifest. And now we have a very nice answer for what the particle hole exchange is, right? Because we said particle hole should take me from a one third state from a two third state. But what was the one third state? It was this guy. And what was the two third state? It was this guy. And here it's obvious, right? Here I literally just reflect to go from three halves to minus three halves. So literally, what do I do? I say, this is what the electrons, right? The electrons have some filling fraction on both sides. And for the composite fermions, again, all I do is I go from one integer state to a reflected integer state, where I just, again, reflect about the zero line. All right? And similarly, I can do this for other states. Two-fifths and three-fifths is five-halves and minus five-halves. And so again, I had filled everything up to plus two, and that reflected means I empty everything up to minus two. Are there any questions? So I, I showed you some pictures, and I, and I want to, in, in, the, in the few remaining minutes, try to, without showing you the, the details of the calculation, um, try to convince you that this is really sensible. So I, we, we constructed this graphene-like model that's supposed to be an analogy to flux attachment, but is more precise. 
But what is it good for, right? All I told you is it can give you the correct Hall conductance, and that's not very useful. We want to have something nicer. So one beautiful thing that you can ask about is something like density waves. Now, the system is an insulator, so to create a density wave, you have to add a finite amount of energy to the system and look for something that has a wave-like pattern. So how do you do that? You have your sample, and you do inelastic photon scattering, right? If I take the sample, and I hit it with the photon, and that photon has some finite amount of energy and some fixed wave vector, and then my sample absorbs it, that means that the sample has an excited state that has a wave vector that was the wave vector of the photon and has an energy of the energy of the photon. So you can look to see when does this system really nicely absorb by uh, photons and when does it let them scatter off. And this has been done experimentally. So now this is some nice experimental data for a bunch of these Jain states. So what is this axis? This is again the, the, the wave vector of the photon in, in units of the magnetic length. And this is the energy cost. So where, where the system is most likely to absorb it, which tells you where you really think this is an honest to God excitation of the system. And what does it look like, right? Well, it's always finite energy, and you see that it kind of goes down and up and down and up and down and up and it kind of wiggles, right? And so two-fifths, they absorb one dip, three-sevenths, they see two, four-ninths, they see more. All right? And this is just some nice experimental data. And because I'm short on time and I don't really want to go into the details, I don't have time to tell you the, the answer, the composite fermion story I told you, just starting with something that looks like graphene and saying there's a way of mapping my gallium arsenide fractional state to a graphene-like integer state, that system is actually constrained enough that I, can't get, I couldn't tell you the precise structure of all of this curve, but that theory can make a very sharp prediction, which is the following. Where are the minima of these curves, right? So that's not the whole curve, but you can at least find the minima. And in some approximations, which basically corresponds to that projection where I sent the higher bands to infinity, so particle whole is, is perfect, there are no free parameters. If you tell me the wave, if you tell me which Jane state you're looking at, I can tell you where I think the minima should be. Right? And this is what you get, right? Yeah. So for four nights, this is the data, and these green lines are our guesses with no free parameters, right? There's no coupling constant I can tune to match this. This is just, it's a simplified model, and that's why there are no free parameters. But in that simplified uh, model, I do pretty well for four nights, right? This, for earlier ones are better, the second one is not perfect. Uh, three sevenths. You also do pretty well, right? I hit that minimum pretty well. I hit that minimum not too badly. Even two fifths, it's not perfect, though this is kind of missing some data, so I could argue that maybe they should do more experiments. Um, but you know, you were certainly in the ballpark, right? If I had guessed something way over here, or way over here, I never would have believed this. And in fact, this is now, unfortunately, the same picture reflected, so now this axis is the wave vector, and this is the energy cost, and so there's a minimum as a function of wave vector, and you basically hit it on the nose, right? So again, this is our prediction, and that's where you experimentally observe it. These black dots are not the actual data point that this curve is being fit to, don't worry. Um, so I think, you know, you look at a curve like this with no free parameters, that's a pretty remarkable agreement with actual experiments. And the reason is that we used as much symmetry as possible. We said we really want this particle whole symmetry relating these two types of states to be explicitly manifest. And that very, very strongly constrains the system and lets you make some surprisingly accurate predictions. Um, now, unfortunately, as of now, there aren't uh, published results for what those curves would look like for the other states, the two fifths, three halves, or sorry, three fifths, four sevenths, etc. Um, we would predict that you would basically have them look exactly the same, but people just haven't been haven't done those experiments yet. Um, but you know, I, I, I think that for something that's basically fixed by a pure number, to hit it that well, I think is uh, pretty remarkable. Thank you.
seven feet, a physical one, a lot faster. Uh, so th these these Jane states that I studied are likely not actually useful for building quantum gates and. The, while, I, while I talked about the possibility of building quantum computers out, out of fractional quantum Hall states, as I said three weeks ago, whatever the last lecture was, uh, the current state of the art for quantum computing is not really done with fractional quantum Hall states. It's, 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 it's very hard. Um, the argument for studying these is that because of the topological stability of them, if you were able to build one, it would be more stable, but the problem is they haven't been able to build one yet. Um, so, I mean, yeah, current, current quantum computing isn't done with systems like these. It's really done with uh, little superconductors built into Josephson junctions. Uh, the other option is you could make a qubit basically out of a molecule uh, by, by doing kind of NMR type work. And NMR is you have some complicated molecule, and it has some kind of overall magnetic moment, and you can have that relax, and that overall magnetic moment can act like a uh, But so, uh, unfortunately, these states, I, I, I don't think I would be honest in saying that the primary reason I studied them is to study a quantum computer. I think I, I studied them because they're interesting. Going back to the justice and things, is that more like the, the D wave uh, annealing on the computer? I don't know enough about what, 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 what they're doing to give you an answer. I know that. Uh, superconducting qubits, which are these things built out of little Joseph's injunctions, is what people uh, like Martinez and Santa Barbara are doing, and, and other people, that's just the person that I know, uh, are, are doing, and that's very promising, I think. For instance, if you look at kind of uh, experimental work actually trying to say, use a quantum computer to factor a number, the two systems that are primarily used that have worked very well are both superconducting qubits and these NMR qubits. I'll end with this. This has been a great series. When I leave here with a headache, I know it's been a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Your work on uh, curved surface, is that a purely mathematical uh, exercise, so to speak, for you? Or are there good consequences? There, there, are, there can be consequences. So, so the, the question was, I, I've said previously that uh, I studied these partially from a geometric aspect. It wasn't something that I had a chance to talk about today, uh, unfortunately. I, I could just briefly mention that the, the notion that I have this mapping that maps things to graphene-like states instead of regular integer states has profound implications for how these things respond to curvature. But the question was, is that purely a mathematical framework, or is it possible to look for experimental results? So there are proposals. So even in graphene, Graphene is supposed to be this perfect hexagonal lattice, but it isn't always. And so you might ask, what if there's a defect? You know, what, what if instead of a place where I have a hexagon, I have a pentagon or a septagon? That will actually buckle the system a little bit and make it a little bit curved. And there are, there are people who have conjectured that if you could try to look at those spots in the material, you should see a little bit of a charge excess or a charge defect. And the structure of that excess or defect will be kind of intrinsically tied to my graphene composite fermion model. Um, but as far as I know, people haven't actually done, uh, pe people haven't done that experiment anywhere to the degree where they've been able to say, this is a, this is a curvature defect, right, a little bump in the surface, and that bump in the surface has or does not have an explicit charge excess or, or, or uh, recess. But it's, it's, it's one of the many reasons to study this. Okay. Yeah. I'm probably going to ask, uh, do you plan like on experimenting to find out like the two thirds, three fifths? So I don't, I don't plan on doing any experiments. Uh, I plan on pestering people who are extremely good at this oh. and asking them when they are going to convince a graduate student to do it as a thesis project. Because okay. that, that's how these things actually work. So you're more of like a... Like I, I, I do a calculation. And then I first hope that no one else has done the calculation. And if no one else has done the calculation, I see if anyone has done the experiment. Okay. And if someone has done the experiment, I cross my fingers and look at the result and hope it agrees with mine. Okay. And if it does, I'm very happy. And if it doesn't, uh, I have to come up with an excuse. Oh, okay. uh, and if no one has done the experiment, then you very, very politely ask experimentalists, is this an any way conceivable experiment and would anyone do it? 
And for that to ever be the case, you have to have some reasons to, you know, for instance, uh, discover novel effects. For, so, for instance, this this proposal of this graphene-inspired model to describe these chain states uh, does give predictions that are different than that flux attachment picture. And so that's a reason to try to convince people to do these experiments because we want to know. Is, is this graphene-inspired model really correct or not? Or is something that looks more like that magnetic field line absorption story correct? Probably. No. Other questions? I was, uh, yes, so to various degree, do all metals have a certain property as if you were able to take a sheet, a fine sheet of metal like gold or lead or graphene, the structure is going to be Is there a copy of the metal where you know that? So, yeah, so, so, the, so for when, when you study this, it's, it's a kind of a, a study of what, the, what possible structures can metals have. Uh, and that's, I mean, there, there's a, there's a well-studied theory that basically devolves to chemistry. Because what you say is that if I have a bunch of ions in some ionic lattice, uh, a chemistry book will basically tell you what types of angular bonds are energetically preferred, in the, in the same way that you can, you can calculate using some chemistry principles, what is the angle of an H2O molecule? Um, now, that, that's a story that's true for two or three dimensional uh, objects. It's a, it's, it's, it's a well known thing. You can look in kind of any standard introduction to solid state physics, and they will tell you the story of saying if you know what your material is made of, what is that underlying lattice supposed to look like? And, and you know, that's the story that basically tells you. A whole bunch of carbon that's stuck to two dimensions will look like this. When we speak of a, uh, <clears throat> of a spin of electron, plus one half, one half, nothing but just spin, spin is a characteristic. But what about if the graviton exists, they say it's plus two spin? Are we talking about the same characteristic? Yes. We are talking yes. Now, now it, it's important to, to distinguish two different things. So spin is a statement of what angular momentum looks like on very, very, very small scales. And when I talked about electrons, I drew pictures where I made an analogy of that spin to always being aligned with the magnetic, mo the, the magnetic moment of the electron, which is the statement that an electron is a tiny magnet. And it turns out that the orientation of the magnet is aligned with the orientation of the angular momentum of the electron. That's not, uh, that's, that's not true for everything. So for instance, a photon has spin, it has spin plus or minus one, but it does not look like a tiny magnet, nor does the graviton. But they do, in a sense, have a notion of internal intrinsic angular momentum. I just, I just want to clarify, because since I've been talking about electrons this whole quarter, I've always kind of secretly conflated angular momentum with kind of magnetic orientation. And that's something that's really true for things like electrons, not for things like photons or gravitons. Let me interrupt here. And there's going to be time to ask questions of Matthew for the next hour here. My name is Scott Wakeley. I introduced Matthew at the beginning of the quarter. I'm the EFI director. Um, I just wanted to break in here to ask all of you to join me in thanking Matthew for an entire quarter with lectures. These are a lot of work. And he has to do all of his regular work too. So, uh, you know, I, I hope you appreciate the efforts there.